Hello and welcome to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast, where we talk about life, death and experiences in between. I'm Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and I trust that the conversations within this podcast will offer value, insight and information into what happens in the afterlife. To find out more about the free online community and extra content, be sure to click subscribe and to check out the links in the notes below. And now, let's get into today's episode. And then what happened was as my heart rate was getting lower and slower, this strange shape appeared out of the wall of my living room. And I was very, very frightened. It was a very distressing situation for me. And I felt a real sense of malevolence and there was a bird sitting up there. And as soon as I looked at the bird, boom, I left my body and I was in the bird, getting a bird's eye view of me sitting on the deck and my daughter playing in the yard. Welcome back to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Today, I'm joined by Cheryl Gottschall who's not only had a near-death experience, but she has had many, many spiritual experiences, spiritual transformational experiences, ones which have propelled her into the exploration, into the paranormal. She works as a holistic therapist at the Body Light Centre. She's the host of the Afterlife Discussions Group based out of Brisbane. She's had many media appearances, and she's talking about all sorts of things in the spiritual conversation. So Cheryl Gottschall, welcome to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Very warm welcome to you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. It's great to have another person from down under, down this side of the world joining me. So much to talk about. Where do we start? How did your near-death experience happen? Well, I had a chronic illness for 10 years and I tried many different therapies like traditional therapies which weren't working Surgery was offered. I didn't want to do that. And I think like a lot of people who are ill for a long time, you get to the point where you're starting to look at, like I did homeopathy and we're seeing naturopaths. Look, I've tried all sorts of things, but, and then you go to the hands-on healers. Mm. So, which I did this particular day. And when I came back, I laid on the couch at home in the living area things seemed to start to change my heartbeat was getting slower and slower actually and I noticed that on the inside of my right elbow every time my heart beat it would be like a surge of energy would pump out from that particular chakra which apparently you have an chakra in your inner elbow as well as the outer elbow oh wow I didn't know that I didn't <laughs> no. know at the time yeah <laughs> wow so basically I sprung a leak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. And then what happened was as my heart rate was getting lower and slower, this strange shape appeared out of the wall of my living room. And it was, if you imagine a, an ice cream cone on its side, so you've got the thinner point at one end and the rounder point at the other, like that. But it was very malleable, very flex fluid like the thinner part was coming from my wall and opened up into the middle of my living room, like the top of the cone was opened horizontally and it started swirling and swirling and a very strong gravitational pull, if I could say it that way, began. What happened next was I split off from my body. I always say split off. I don't know why, but it felt like I split. (laughs) Rather than separated, you know, but it felt like it was splitting. And the part of my non-physical self was actually clinging on to the back of the lounge chair while my physical body was just laying there perfectly still, just watching these two realities, my ordinary reality and this other reality that was taking place. And I just didn't want to be pulled in, so I'm hanging on like this. Who knew you could do that when you were in a non-physical form? It's it's very strange, like some of the strange things that happen during NDEs. How do you see when you don't actually have physical eyes? Mm. So anyway, and then that went on for a while and I was very, very frightened. It was a very distressing situation for me. And 
I felt a real sense of malevolence if I let go and I went through that tunnel. I didn't think it wasn't just fear. It was a sense of malevolence, a sense of dread about what would be waiting on the other side, which was really odd. So anyway, that went on for a while. And then this, I always say ticker tape, but maybe that's not the right word. But, you know, the the old fashioned, they get the telegrams, Mm. would come on a piece of paper. You'd see it in the war movies. The information would come in. They'd be reading the message on on the long, thin strip of paper. Yeah. And on there was my daughter's name. And as soon as I read that, boom, it all stopped. It just completely stopped. And I just, I just slayed there and I, my non-physical self came back into my physical body and the whole situation was over. But it was a turning point for me in my illness because that had gone on for 10 years and in the middle of that was three years of acute illness. And that was in that time frame was in that three year period was when the, I call it a near death experience, but it was some sort of strange death like experience. I knew I was getting close to death and uh, I had felt that way for some time, but that particular experience, it was just like the the watershed moment (laughs) Mm. and it was quite frightening. And so I feel for people who have distressing experiences like that. So that was that particular experience. Yeah, that does sound actually quite terrifying. You were talking about how you were hanging behind the back of the couch, literally with your your fingers over the side. Yeah, clinging, not wanting to go in there. You're talking about how you felt the fear of not getting wound up in this tunnel. That was that you're feeling that fear in your spiritual being? Or was that your physical being and you were aware of being a spiritual being hanging onto the back of the couch? A really good question because... Actually, at the time, my consciousness encapsulated both my physical and my non-physical self. Yeah. I I was aware of everything. So it's really hard to separate whether that was I was feeling that physically or non-physically. I was just completely feeling it. Mm. I think that's what terror is like. It's overpowering, you know, overwhelming. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It just takes over everything. True terror, doesn't it? Yeah. And your daughter, I was thinking you saw your daughter's name on this ticker tape. Was your daughter, I assume she was alive, she'd been born at that time? Yes. How old was she at that time? She was uh, in her late teens, I think she was, yeah. Any idea why you saw your daughter's name? Like, what did that do? I don't know. It didn't really do anything. (laughs) Yeah. It seemed to be the catalyst. I mean, I know sometimes people talk about they're told to go back or... I'm not really sure. It was like, it was the spark, I guess you could say, that snapped me out of it. Put it that way. It might be a way of explaining it. That snapped me out of that situation so that I regrouped, basically, and came back into this reality. Yeah, I was wondering whether that might be what you're going to say because I've talked to experiences who it's when they, maybe they don't get given a choice, but they get the feeling that they want to stay, that they want to progress with the experience that's taking place. And then it's, an understanding of their children or their loved ones who are going to remain, what life will be like without them, and that jolts them back into returning? For me, that's what it was, to see her name. and But I didn't feel like I, I had no sense of awareness about needing to come back or thinking about it or having a choice. It just boom like that, you know. Just happened. So you didn't feel any element of control or anything within your no, experience? Everything was out of my hands, yeah. Yeah. Except for the clinging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hanging on for dear life, literally. Yeah. I love it because all the experiences are different. This one's definitely different. I feel like my own experience is very different. And I think it's great. I, I love the variety within the experiences because there is so much that goes on. You can't describe it. We can't understand it Mm. at all. Mm. So I know you've had a lot of spiritual experiences, a lot. Was this like the precursor to what followed or had you already had spiritual experiences before this? Where does this fit in? Well, I wouldn't describe them as spiritual. I describe them as paranormal because for me, spiritual engages the divine, whereas paranormal, it's just things that happen that are just not, they may be paranatural, Mm. they're not normal you know what I mean they're just a beyond normal so one of them that I had was where I had a couple of out out of body experiences and one was when I was driving down my street and I suddenly found myself coming towards home and I found myself behind myself while I'm at the wheel 
oh, wow. And then I was out of it. Suddenly I went, oh, my God, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Driving again. <laughs> that was like a taste of what was to come because not long after, I had another experience where I was sitting out on the front deck at, at ground level watching my daughter, who was three at the time, play in the front yard. And and I was, it was a beautiful day and it was sunny, it was quiet, and it was just one of those lovely days where you go, gosh, this is gorgeous, you know, gorgeous weather. Mm. And I was very, very relaxed. And that may have been a reason why it actually occurred because I was sitting there and then I just looked up onto the power pole, which was just outside, not, as, not quite in front of my house, but out on the corner of the neighbor's block. And there was a bird sitting up there. And as soon as I looked at the bird, boom, I left my body and I was in the bird getting a bird's eye view of me sitting on the deck and my daughter playing in the yard. And I could see over the roof of my house. I could see over the roof of the, the houses uh, below because it was on a slight slope. So I'm sort of looking down and uh, you can see the road and it's like the vision was exactly like I'm looking at you. It was as clear, as clear mm. as that like high definition which is really unusual too because again I wasn't using physical eyes mm. well maybe I was I was looking through the bird's eyes because after that I wondered what happened to the bird what, <laughs> well, the that bird? was what I was going to ask you <laughs> did the bird go into me was it seeing the world through my eyes or what happened but you know as I've mentioned uh, previously in with you that shamans are actually known to you or have the ability to project their consciousness into animals so they can see off somewhere where they're not physically there mm. and they can utilize the faculties of the animals that they project into mm. you know the smell and the taste and the vision and the sound to have information relayed back to them which is really fascinating now maybe people who have those experiences westerners if we're in a different environment in a more indigenous environment people might be recognized for showing certain abilities and be taken for training in that particular field who knows who knows gosh you've really got me thinking there that's amazing so you'll never know what happened to the bird because that was my thing is as you're out of body, you're in your bird, and I've heard of people connecting with things, with trees, with whatever they see, suddenly they become the thing that they're looking at. They feel drawn to it. They become it. You're watching yourself. What were you doing playing with your daughter? Would anyone sitting up there with you, would they have known that you were out of your body? No. I was still sitting on the chair, and I was just sitting there watching her while she's frolicking around in the garden, and I'm just sitting there very relaxed. And I hadn't keeled over because my spirit wasn't in my body or anything like that. Yeah. I, it was just like, for some reason, some aspect of myself was able to leave. And yet my physical body was still able to function, which is really curious, isn't it? Oh, it totally is. Yeah. Do you remember coming back into your body, leaving the bird? No. By the time I'm looking around and then I'm going, what the, what the heck is going on? <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I, it just snapped and I'm boom, back in my body. There was no awareness of transition at all. Oh, wow. Nothing. It was just instantaneous. Yeah. Wow. That blows my mind. It's a conversation I'm having a little bit of at the moment is what happens when we're out of body. Mm. What happens to the body? Does it slump over? Does it continue? And I've got a few people telling me different things there. So really interesting to hear that. Has anything like that happened again? Will you become something? Something different? <laughs> wow. <laughs> An animal or? Yes, yes. In the outer body sense, I suppose. It wasn't out of body. It was, it was a bit different because having those experiences and other paranormal experiences led me to shamanism, which, by the way, I actually now teach. <laughs> Some of us teach shamanic journeying. And sometimes while I'm drumming myself, you go into an altered state of consciousness and this one particular time a lion appeared and the lion's energy came in within me and I felt like this, I became a lion and I was roaring and in my power. It was a very strange experience, but it does have those sorts of things do happen and other people have reported those types of experiences. Some people feel like they take on the features of owls, for example. 
And actually, when you look at people, like, because in shamanic journeying, I teach people to find their power animals. And the interesting thing is that if you study the people, they actually have qualities of those animals that they connect with. And some will actually, when you study them, like someone I know has owl as a power animal, and they actually stand there and just very body still, but the eyes just look like this yeah mine's mine's a deer so I'm very quick and flighty and sensitive and I have really good hearing yeah it's it's a very interesting thing and I wonder do in that experience that I had where I left my body and went into the bird you know was I somehow connecting spontaneously of course but in a way that was necessary for me at the time to see the world through the bird's eye view Mm. I don't know or perhaps do you think there could have been something in that for the bird maybe it wasn't about you at all is that possible? well I can only interpret it through (laughs) through my experience yeah yeah (laughs) exactly my brain just keeps going (laughs) yeah I do think that we have certain experiences at certain times for particular reasons and sometimes it may be and I think that our soul chooses this Or we've had teachers in the past who have inserted experiences into our energy field that somehow manifest in this life or in future lives. And I don't know if anyone who's listening has heard about the Tibetan Terma tradition because that's exactly what it is, where master teachers, you can have physical termas and you can have termas of consciousness, in consciousness. So information is embedded into the energy field of a person, a student, that when the time is right, that information will somehow be catalyzed for them to continue on their journey or on their path. And it's the same with physical term is that things are dug up archaeologically at a particular time for a particular reason for humanity. Mm. So there's, there's a lot going on there that we really don't understand. And I do think that we have these experiences at certain times for certain reasons. So are you saying that we have these experiences because they initiate some of that change or they equip us with something? You're talking about how we put events in, well, we don't, but events get put into our future, into our life. Yeah. Do you think these experiences are triggering that? I've yeah. lost for words, actually. Yeah, I think that there is somehow it's a possibility because this is a a, the tibetans have been around for a long time and they've developed these very long esoteric and deeply rich traditions so i think that we may not know how it manifests but manifest it does and perhaps when the timing's right that the and you could look at it astrologically too a good astrologer will tell you those types of things too So when the timing is right, these things somehow manifest. I don't know. I'm not the master teacher here. (laughs) It just seems to me that that, that's true. or It it seems to be, from my observations, it seems to work in people's lives like that, put it that way. Yeah, exactly. And I think that we do get equipped with certain things through these experiences or we have significant teaching moments where suddenly something opens up and we understand something. Mm. it blows my mind because there is so much in what you've just said and literally my brain is actually quite struggling with all of the concepts and the the possibilities and things like that why do you think that that initial near-death experience happened for you oh gee whiz um you know it's a funny thing because I was interested in near-death experiences back in the 70s and reading about paranormal experiences in the 80s, I became a member of the International Association of Near Death Studies. Uh-huh. And then in the 90s, I actually had a near death experience. So you've got to, if you back engineer that whole process, yeah. you've got to wonder why. It's a great question. It's a great question. I wish I had the answer. Yeah, exactly. And I think so many of us don't know why we have these experiences. But I find that really interesting because. I've always been interested in spiritual things. Wait, I mean, I was young when I had my NDE, but I was really curious about a lot of things that kids my age maybe shouldn't have been curious about. And I'm talking like spiritual perspective and questioning why there's so many different beliefs out there. Why are there so many different 
concepts and mm-hmm. you know I'd question colors and I'd go to my mother and I'd say blah 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 and give her questions and she'd just look at me and go how have you come up with that <laughs> and I think well I'm just curious I just want to know the answer and so I I wonder whether actually we know subconsciously or in a spiritual level we know that this experience is going to happen to us but we're, we're more open to it's going to happen. So we start to look into things or we're more accepting of these types of things. Mm. I think the word you were going to say might have been predisposed. I think you're right. Do you think that? I, I was like, no, that's not the right word. I don't know if that's the right word, but almost more open, but on a subconscious level. Well, shamans would say that people who become shamans, for example, and let's just change that to Western wording, people who have paranormal experiences or pre-people who have, have a um, personality that becomes shamanized, let's say it that mm. way too, that they are born with that seed in them. And then these experiences occur that break that seed open and plant it and help it grow. I think that's a possibility. Mm. My brain is actually just really struggling right now. <laughs> it's all good. Mm. I've lost my train of thought completely, Cheryl. Sorry, the siren and everything's just totally got me. It's all right. <laughs> Let me pick something up. Yeah, I think that there are encounter-prone personalities in society, in the world, everywhere. And I think that some of those people, it's like I, because I've been in the UFO field for over 30 years and talking to people about paranormal experiences and near-death experiences Let's just say UFOs, for example, people who have those sightings, the statistics don't match with randomness. For example, if one in 30 people see a UFO, then two in 60 and on and on and on. That's not how it happens. One person has multiple sightings in their life. Okay. So statistically, you would think if it was random, then those experiences would be peppered randomly throughout society, but they are not. And I think that people who have near-death experiences might be like that too, or paranormal experiences. I mean, look at Daniel Brinkley, how many NDEs has he had, right? Or people who have out-of-body experiences, how many of those do they have? I know people who have those all the time. Yeah, yeah. It must be a weird life, you know. (laughs) So um, mind-bending. So I certainly think there are encounter-prone personalities in the world. The other thing I've found is that they're usually highly sensitive people. And there's a book by Dr. Elaine Aron about HSPs or highly sensitive people. And I think in that book, she talks about 2% of every species of life are highly sensitive, more so than the rest of the herd, shall we put it like that. And I think there's probably a good reason for that. I think it might be a biological imperative. You imagine if something's coming, you need some say you're a buffalo, you need a handful of buffaloes that will be aware of that before the rest of the herd are so that they can say, you know, let's get going, guys. Let's get out of here because there is a threat coming our way. And you have that with people, for example, who won't get on a plane because they suddenly think it's going to crash. That At the last minute, they just decide not to get that plane. And it does crash, Mm. those sorts of things. So there are people in the world who have these experiences. And I think that if if we we're living in a different world, then that would be really important. If we we're living on the land, uh, Indigenous, and let's face it, I, my father was a bushy, meaning a man who lived on the land and horses and grew things, etc. And he was very sensitive to his environment and he could douse for water just using the branches of a tree, twigs of a tree, and he could douse and know where to build, where to dig Mm. for water, those sorts of things. So there are people in the world who are like that. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off there. No, that's okay. I think we have to acknowledge that in the Western world, we don't have the context for those experiences. If we're living in an Indigenous world, then those particular people, that 2% might be the ones who are taken away to, to learn about healing, to learn about how to care for the environment, to help interpret people's dreams, to look after the tribe, all those sorts of things. Mm. It seems like there was a lot more discussion 
I'm going to say in previous times, but also when you get into cultural groups, I think there's a lot more discussion that takes place. I think we're very much just in our nine to five working life. This is life. And to think that you could hold sticks over the ground and work out where the water is seems so ridiculous. And yet it's something which has been taking place for generations, years and years and years. And it would be really easy for us to actually exclude a lot of things because it's on a spiritual level. I'm not saying the water's a spiritual level, but there's something which happens there. They're able to tune into something. And I think that there's so much on offer for us who are able to tune in. The concept of having multiple experiences, I really hear you on that one because you you talk to a lot of people. There's a lot of people who have had multiple near-death experiences, multiple out-of-body experiences. And yes, I know people as well. It's nearly daily, if not daily. And that made me want to ask you, Cheryl, for you, you've had these out-of-body experiences. Is that something that you continue to have? Is that something you think we can train and anybody can have at any point? I haven't continued to have out-of-body or near-death, thank goodness. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yep. But uh, I've certainly continue, I mean, during my shamanic work, I certainly have go into altered states of consciousness where I access information which is then corroborated in this reality. So, and that that is a, I guess you call it a paranormal experience or paranatural experience too. Yes, you ask, can anybody be trained in doing these things? Yeah, as well. I haven't continued to have out of body or near death. I think I said that already. (laughs) It's okay. I'm going to have to edit that. (laughs) But yeah, I think that While some people can learn how to do these things, I think for some people it's natural. It comes naturally. Again, going back to my previous comment about some people are more predisposed to having these experiences as opposed to the rest of society. Mm, So interesting. You talked about, I loved your description actually, you said paranormal doesn't include the divine. What was the other word we had? Paranormal versus spiritual, I think. Yeah, yeah. So for me, there is a difference between paranormal and a spiritual. I sort of tend to think of spiritual where you're, you're engaged by the divine. And that comes more for me under mystical type of experiences. Whereas, for example, this is where near-death experiences may be where the divine meets the paranormal, right? It's really hard for us to find the right words to talk about these things because you try <laughs> yeah. to describe an experience that happens in another reality with words from this domain. It's almost impossible, but we struggle mm-hmm. along and do our best. But I do think that, like, for example, people who see ghosts, that's not necessarily a spiritual experience, but it's certainly a paranormal experience, right? Or we've talked previously about peak and Darian experiences where people are interacting with others who they're not aware that that other person is actually dead or died two months, two years ago. But they're talking to them, they shake their hand, and then they find out later, oh, no, that John died 18 months ago. What? I just saw him the other day. Yeah, That's not necessarily... To my thinking, a spiritual experience is more a paranormal experience. So you're saying that the spiritual experiences have an element of divinity, of connection to God, source, spirit, being, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yep. So what are your thoughts around a divine? Do you have a belief system? Do you connect with a particular explanation? It's very hard to put words onto what it actually is, but do you? Yeah. where do you stand with that? I certainly think there is a greater intelligence that governs many, many things. And I know like in shamanism, I teach about the great spirit. Some people will call it God. Some people will call it the universal intelligence or universal energy or cosmic energy. Some people might refer to it as the quantum consciousness, which some people with a scientific leaning might use that word too, where we're plugging into the world wide web of consciousness, the collective um, collective consciousness is a bit different but um well maybe it's not again it's hard to (laughs) separate all these things isn't it maybe they're not so yes I certainly believe in a higher intelligence a higher power I speak to it since I've sort of connected with shamanic practices 
I can walk out into the backyard and feel a really deep connection with all living things that I would interact with. Because in shamanism, we journey to the spirit of the plants. And some people might have heard of the use of ayahuasca and Mm. the people who create that brute so that others have altered states of consciousness and profoundly deep experiences. Those people are asked, well, how did you learn this? And they say the spirits of the plants taught us. And how did they, how did they even find that out? And I also have a deep interest in astrology. So I know that the planets have a profound effect on life in the world, on planet Earth. And I see that playing out in the world stage over and over and over again. And in my own life too, in others' lives. So there are these huge cycles and huge energetic imprints that we stamped with when we're born right which play out in our life for the rest of our life so yeah there's a cosmic intelligence what it is i don't know exactly but it's there it's really there and it's comforting in a way to know that i'm part of that intelligence that we're all part of that intelligence an expression and a manifestation of that intelligence, Mm. having an experience through us. And that information goes back to that intelligence. Mm. Thank you. It's always interesting to understand what people's individual perspectives are. There are so many possibilities, aren't there? I love that you talked about how things play out in our lives and you've talked about how events can be, I'm going to use the word inserted into our lives. I can't remember exactly what we said. What's your thoughts around our life? Is it pre-planned? Do we choose it? Do we plan it before we come? Do others plan it for us? Can we plan it as we're here? How much choice do we have, free will versus predestination, I suppose? I think we have both. Like I said, when you're born, you're stamped like a... It's like someone takes a a cosmic photograph and you're stamped with the astrology of your birth, date, time and location. There's a pattern in that, and that pattern is there set. And not many people live outside that pattern from my observations over the years, but there are ways and means along the path. So we have predestination, but we also have choices as to how we will walk down that path. And we can walk confidently and positively, or we can walk kicking and screaming, but we're going down that path, you know. Mm, so mm. Um, I think there's both going on there. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Cheryl, I know that there's a lot to talk about. If you're listening and you're interested to know more with Cheryl, you're interested to ask your own questions, we are going to be doing a live session in the next couple of weeks. So have a look at the Facebook page, have a look at the information that's coming out there to see when the data that is and the time so you can tune in. In that live session, we'll go into some more detail around some of Cheryl's specific experiences, some maybe some UFO things, some more paranormal, more spiritual experiences. We'll talk more about the shamanism. There's much, much more to this conversation. So we've just had a little taste test of so many conversations. Cheryl, I want to thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing your insights, sharing your near-death experience, which was quite some time ago now, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, when did you say that was in the 90s? Yes, it was. I think it was about 96. Yeah. Did it take you a while to start to share that? Yeah, I guess it did because it was very distressing and I really didn't want to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And, and at that time in the 90s, we weren't hearing about distressing NDEs. Mm. So I wasn't really sure about where to put it, what category it would be if I put it anywhere. Mm. And I actually did reach out and talk about it briefly on a to a group and I was just shut down and it was just horrible experience. So I never spoke about it again for a few years. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that because even if it's not positive, we need to be sharing the experiences. Well, I believe I understand there's a lot connected with that and it's not so simple, but yeah, that actually makes me quite sad. So yeah. We are grateful that you've come on to share with us today, even though it was distressing to share about that. I'm still really just thinking about the bird. I want to know where did the bird go and did that all happen for the bird? Don't ask me why that's in my mind, but I find it interesting. We've talked about many different things. So Cheryl Gottschall, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. 
Don't forget to subscribe to stay updated with all of the events we have going on and to visit www.letstalknearedeath.com to join the VIP community.